Hi everyone, my name is Rosie Masui. I work at the Kachemak Bay National Ester and Research Reserve in Homer, Alaska as the Harmful Species Program Coordinator. Um, today we're doing a quick presentation where we're discussing harmful algal blooms and marine mammals and the interactions between the two. Um, this presentation really was having a goal of providing some information. Um, I'm gonna do a light overview of who we are at the reserve, talk about harmful algal blooms, we'll talk a little bit about marine mammals, and then we'll provide some resources at the end. So the Kachemak Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve is the only research reserve located in the state of Alaska. As you can see, reserves are located across the country. Um, we are a combination of a federal and a state partnership, with our federal partnership being from NOAA and the National Estuarine Research Reserve System, and our state partner is the University of Alaska Anchorage, the Alaska Center for Conservation Science. And together that makes up us. So you can see there's a couple photos there. I'm on the left-hand side. I'm the program coordinator. And Jasmine Maurer is our research technician. Our harmful algal bloom community monitoring program actually covers um, South Central Alaska. So we have monitors from Lower Cook Inlet through Prince William Sounds. And more recently, we've been partnering with folks on St. Paul Island to do a mix of phytoplankton monitoring, as well as collecting some shellfish for toxin testing. But first, I'd really like to provide some information about harmful algal blooms, just some kind of basics about what they are. This definition comes from NOAA, um, and what it says is harmful algal blooms, or HABs, occur when colonies of algae, these are simple plants that live in the sea and fresh water, grow out of control and produce toxic or harmful effects on people, fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and birds. The human illnesses caused by HABs, although rare, can be debilitating or even fatal. Within our program, we are primarily focusing on those microscopic plankton, specifically phytoplankton that occur within the marine environment that can cause different types of problems, specifically shellfish poisonings typically. So concerns around harmful algal blooms in the past have really been focused on human consumption of potentially toxic shellfish. So this image that you can see right here, you can see there's some plankton cells and those are being accumulated by that clam, right? They're kind of filter feeding. Um, and that's how toxins can get from plankton to potentially humans for consuming them. So that's really where our concerns have been in the past. But more recently, our concerns have grown. Here to join us specifically to talk about harmful algal blooms and marine mammals is Kathy LeFay. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Kathy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name's Kathy LeFay, and I'm a research biologist at NOAA Fisheries Northwest Fisheries Science Center. And I lead a program called the Wildlife Algal Toxins Research and Response Network, or WARN West, as we like to call it. Um, it's, we're located in Seattle, Washington. and Warren West does surveillance for the presence of harmful algal bloom toxins in marine mammals and wildlife um, from as far north as the Arctic Ocean down to Southern California. So we, we sample on a regular basis. Great. Thanks, Kathy. And um, right now I'm going to just roll into some questions and hopefully provide some folks with some answers about harmful algal blooms and how they potentially can impact or interact with marine mammals. Um, so Kathy, can harmful algal blooms have negative impacts on marine mammals? Yes, absolutely. Um, these, as you mentioned, these blooms can produce toxins and two of the main toxins or syndromes that we're concerned about recently in um, Arctic and subarctic waters are uh, those that cause paralytic shellfish poisoning or saxitoxins and those that cause amnesic shellfish poisoning or domoic acid. So these are two different types of harmful algal blooms, um, but we know that these cells are in those waters. So we know from examples in other places in the world that yes, marine mammals can be impacted significantly by these toxins. They are both neurotoxins um, that can cause health impacts and can be fatal to marine mammals. Great, that's good to know. Um, so where have harmful algal blooms had confirmed negative impacts on marine mammals and what happened when these were confirmed events? So 
that the best, the very best example, or one of the best examples of uh, marine mammals being impacted by harmful algal bloom toxins are uh, for the toxin domoic acid, which is produced again by the Pseudonychia uh, diatoms. And we have regular blooms on the California coast and hundreds, dozens to hundreds of sea lions every year suffer from domoic acid poisoning or domoic acid toxicosis, we call it. Um, the first time it was recognized was in 1998. And before that, we didn't know if these toxins would impact marine mammals. It's an interesting story because in 1998, it was my first year at grad school at UC Santa Cruz. I was studying domoic acid and its mechanism of toxicity. And it was Labor Day weekend and uh, the newspaper came in saying, sea lions are having seizures on beaches, stranding, no one knows why. It was pretty dramatic. Hundreds of animals, it hadn't happened before. Um, someone brought me the article and they suggested it might be mercury poisoning. Well, I was sitting there looking at the mechanism of toxicity for demoic acid. I said, I think it's demoic acid. So myself, Francis Scullin at the Marine Mammal Center and some folks at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, Chris Scholin, did a full investigation and, and found out that it was a pseudonychia bloom, high levels of demoic acid in anchovies, and then causing death and seizures in hundreds of sea lions. And since that time, it's happened to at some level every year. Every year. Wow. No, I've um, definitely very concerning, especially hearing, um, you know, and seeing the reports in the news and wondering what this could potentially be related to, <clears throat> but knowing that history in California. Um, are there visual indications that a marine mammal is being impacted by a harmful algal bloom or behaviors to watch for? I know you just mentioned some seizures, right? Yes, and so that's um, for demoic acid. That's one of the toxins as we're talking about. And again, it's a neurotoxin and it's an excitotoxin. So it overstimulates nerves in mammals. So in humans as well, that's, that's the problem. It overstimulates nerves, so they fire too much. Um, which causes seizures um, and, and it can cause death um, and it, it can cause brain damage and then have permanent memory loss, which is why that syndrome is called amnesic selfish poisoning. Um, so yes, you can see clinical signs of toxicity, we call it, in or symptoms due to demoic acid poisoning. Um, and those have been pretty well defined. And so in order to, to confirm a mortality event or a health event in marine mammals, you have to have both the presence of the toxin and those clinical signs to be really sure to confirm that. And that's pretty straightforward because it's happened a lot in California. We have a lot of examples there. For the paralytic shellfish poisoning toxins or the saxitoxins or the PSTs, we call them, that is also a neurotoxin, but it's the paralytic, meaning it blocks nerves. It doesn't overexcite nerves, it blocks them so they cannot function and then you get what's called, you get paralysis. Um, and so death comes from usually paralysis of the respiratory um, muscles, so you're uh, unable to breathe. So that makes it more difficult to see and confirm in marine mammals. So we don't have a very good diagnosis of what that looks like yet. But we do know that marine mammals have been impacted by saxitoxin in some locations, but we don't have as good a diagnostic tool for looking at symptoms for that. Gotcha. So not exactly clear from one of those exactly what that's going to look like in a marine mammal, yeah. And yes, and that's something that we're working on. We, we, and, and when we get to the end and talk more about the future projects, you'll see how we're going to be trying to look for that. Great, great. That's good to hear. Um, what are some species, you know, of marine mammals that have been impacted in the past by harmful algal blooms? I know you just mentioned sea lions, um, but what are some other species potentially? So there are many. In fact, that we have reports and, and studies and publications and papers showing uh, effects of harmful algal bloom toxins in whales, uh, Sea lions, obviously, fur seals, um, dolphins, uh, harbor porpoise, um, sea otters. So pretty much many of the marine mammal species have had confirmed events of toxicity due to harmful algal bloom toxins. And especially some of those species that 
naturally occur or have ranges in Alaska? Yes, yes. Um, has there been an event in Alaska where harmful algal blooms have negatively impacted marine mammals? And if so, where did this happen and what happened? So this is a good sort of follow up for what we were just talking about. So we know that these toxins can impact many species of marine mammals. They absolutely can. It's a very consistent sort of method of toxicity. We all have nerves and they all function a certain way. Um, so it has not been uh, clear in Alaska. Well, I, I guess what I want to start with is we uh, published a paper from the Warren West program with a lot of collaborators that showed that these toxins, domoic acid and saxitoxin, are present in 13 species of marine mammals that we sampled in all coastal areas of Alaska. So in the Beaufort Sea, Chukchi Sea, Bering Strait, Bering, North Bering Sea, all the way in through the Gulf of Alaska, the entire coast of Alaska, we sampled marine mammals, either subsistence harvested or stranded, and we were able to detect these toxins there. Now, that just tells us that the risk is there. Those toxins are in the food web and they're at high enough levels that to be detected in these consumers, these mammals. But what we don't know in those regions is whether or not those toxin levels are high enough, whether the dose is high enough to cause the health impacts because we haven't recorded clinical signs like seizures, et cetera. So that's where we are with the Alaska story. That's what we're so interested in pursuing is we know the risks are there. We know those animals will be impacted if the doses are high enough. And our concern is that we are monitoring and seeing that these blooms appear to be increasing, um, which will increase toxin loads in those environments um, with the warming water and conditions, and loss of sea ice, et cetera. So to answer your question, there has been one report in the late 80s that indicated that uh, saxitoxin may have been involved in a sea otter mortality event in Kodiak Island area. Um, again, that was just an association. Um, and then we've had other high toxin levels detected in our program, but we haven't been able to confirm that they are causing death or health impacts. Um, so that's something that we'll, we are pursuing. It's great to hear that you're pursuing that, especially if you're seeing those levels out there, but just aren't sure the potential impacts that they could be having or if they're what they could potentially be leading to. Um, if there is a marine mammal die-off event happening in an Alaskan coastal community, it sounds like there could be a chance that a harmful algal bloom could potentially be involved. Yes, and so, you know, that's the natural sort of progression of, of the information that we're talking about here is that, you know, absolutely those risks are there. I do want to point out that, you know, there are multiple causes of mortality events for sure and health impacts and there are harmful algal bloom toxins can certainly be involved. There's no doubt about that. It happens, you know, we've seen it in multiple places throughout the world and we know those toxins impact animals. So they are one of the things to be thinking about when a mortality event occurs. And those direct impacts are the ones that are more visible, like you see seizures or you see paralysis, et cetera. Then there's the idea about how these toxins have affect the health of the animal and combined effects with other things. Like does it, if, they, if for a sea lion, if they get some brain damage, then they are no longer able to navigate and um, maybe forage properly or things like that. So, so there's a whole gamut of things that we, we know can be impactful um, uh, with, with, with marine mammals. Oh, and so what, are the, what do you do? Was that the question? <laughs> nope, that was just if there was a chance that harmful algal blooms were involved, but that's the next oh. question. So if I see a marine mammal acting weird or washing up dead on the beach, who do I contact to investigate this further? And what type of information should I be paying attention to? Yes, okay, that's great. Um, so we, the Warren West program, we work very closely with the Alaska Marine Mammal Stranding Network. So NOAA's Alaska Marine Mammal Stranding Network, and they have a hotline number, and I'm just gonna read it off here so that you have it. Um, it's 1-877-1-877. Uh, 
925-725-7773. And that's their hotline number. Um, and they're just an incredible group. They respond and record and just pay attention to these marine mammal strandings or deaths or illnesses. Um, and they are gathering this massive database and they do all kinds of examinations. They have veterinarians, et cetera. Um, but we work with them. They usually send samples from animals when they actually can get out there to us at Warren West to look for algal toxins as part of that investigation on what's going on. And so the most critical piece of information when you're reporting a stranding or a sick animal or some sort of event is when you call is to leave the date, the location of the stranding and if possible latitude and longitude uh, the number of animals approximately that seem to be impacted and the species if you can if you know um, and then they also request that you take pictures from different angles um, of the animals if you are able because that provides them some other information on the condition of the animal um, and then they specifically ask that you do not move or touch animals that appear to be sick or dead great no, it's great to have that information also for folks to think about, okay, if I see something on the beach, well, the Alaska Marine Mammal Stranding Network is definitely recommending that you don't immediately go touch it and that this is the information that they're going to want to get from you so that they can kind of begin their investigation of what's happened. Yes, and they're investing, I mean, they may, if it's too remote, they may not be able to get there, but they actually get out to animals. They, they, they take helicopters, they do all kinds of things to get out and investigate. So it is really good to call them in. That's great. And calling and connecting with them about that investigation could kind of help us solve some of the missing pieces in this puzzle when thinking about harmful algal blooms in marine mammals. Do you think that's right? Yes. And that's, that's yeah, that's part of how we're trying to, to um, get concrete information about how these toxins may be impacting the animals. Great. Well, and Kathy, this is my last question and just kind of a follow up and I'm excited to hear what your guys' plans are, but what research or monitoring efforts do you have planned for the future? So it's a super exciting time right now. We have just been funded for the next five years to do a massive harmful algal bloom toxins in Alaskan food webs research project. And I wish, I mean, we have so many collaborators, it's just, it's fabulous. Um, it's funded by EcoHab, which is uh, NOAA's uh, Ecology and uh, Oceanography of Harmful Algal Blooms. My co-primary investigator is Don Anderson from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. He's an expert in the phytoplankton side of it and the blooms, and he's been doing that for his entire career. And then I do the wildlife health, um, algal toxins and food web type thing. So we, uh, got the funding and then we have a list of collaborators that's, um, you know, Alaska Fishery Science Center, Northwest Fishery Science Center, other NOAA entities, Alaska Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife, um, North Slope Borough, uh, communities, remote communities, and we're working together with them, um, and the National Park Service, the USGS, I mean, it, the list goes on, AHAB members and groups, okay, so that, that just tells you the size, I mean, we are excited to get going and here's what we're going to do this is the plan we are going to sample from the beaufort sea chukchi sea north bering sea bering strait around into the gulf of alaska and southeast alaska so during the summers we will have cruisers out there taking samples and we will be doing counts for cells of toxic algae so we'll be looking at how where are the blooms how big are the blooms and how toxic are they? We'll be measuring toxins as well in the blooms. At the same time, we'll be getting phytoplankton samples. I mean, we'll be getting zooplankton samples, which are, for example, krill and copepods. We'll be getting fish samples. We'll be getting benthic clams and worm samples and marine mammal samples. So we're getting all these layers of the food web. We're going to be able to relate where are the blooms, how toxic are they, and when they are that toxic, how much toxin is in the food web and when do we see impacts in marine mammals and have dangerous levels in um, seafood. So we've got this incredible team together. We've also just brought in a physical modeler because we want to add to that model. What are the environmental conditions 
that seem to be related to the bigger blooms, so to cause blooms, can we develop mm -hmm. a predictive model that tells us when a bloom might occur ahead of time? When we know that, if we have all this data that tells us when the cell densities are this, toxin levels are this, consumption rates are this, this is the dose to marine mammals, and at this dose we know it's toxic or not. So we're gonna be able to have a really good information and picture of the food web accumulation of these toxins and then be able to uh, predict what the health impacts will be and, and, and record those. Kathy, that's awesome. I know I'm really excited to hear and have some experts brought up that have been working on HABs across the nation for quite some time and then also to connect them with all the folks in the state of Alaska that are trying to tackle this issue and provide some support, especially the range that you're going to be covering. Um, Kathy, thank you so much. I'm really excited about this future research and monitoring efforts you guys are going to be doing. Thank you for filling in some of these questions about marine mammals. I'm really excited about that and we'll be definitely connecting in the future to hear especially what you're finding once you're able to get that project off the ground, even more so than it's been going already. Yep, absolutely. And that's part of the part of the, pro, the program is a lot of meetings. Of course, we can't have them now with the current situation, but uh, we have planned lots of in person meetings together in these communities um, to be able to share the information as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. That's great news. I'm really excited about this. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, for folks that are listening, I just wanted to share this last slide. So this is a slide of a few different resources that we have out here. Um, so the first one is if you're interested in the Ketchumak Bay National Estuarine Research Reserves Harmful Algal Bloom Monitoring, um, if you just Google KBNERR and Community Monitoring, the first one that comes up is a link right to our website. Um, if you're interested in watching other videos similar to this one, we're doing one as well on seabirds and harmful algal blooms. If you Google AUS, so A-O-O-S, and then AHAB, A-H-A-B, and just videos, it'll pop up with a link that links you right to checking out a few of these videos that we've made. Um, lastly, I wanted to provide a resource here for the Alaska Marine Mammal Stranding Network that Kathy mentioned earlier. So if you Google the Alaska Marine Mammal Stranding Network, that will be the first link that comes right up for you. And the important number to remember right now is if you do see a marine mammal acting weird or passed away on the beach, that the number to call, just to repeat it once more, is 877-925-773. Great. Thanks again, Kathy. Thank you.